Thank you so much for joining me on Unscripted for Christ, where we connect faith and sports to help you to win in this game called Life God's Way. I'm your host, Travis Wilson, and thank you so much for joining me on today. Today, we have a very special guest. Um, it's a woman of God that I've actually, funny thing is, I actually found her on social media and saw so much of the great work that she's doing, um, not only on LSU's campus, but to the world, just the encouraging words that she sent out. And I was like, you know what? reach out to her and i know she's doing a lot of great things so she's so she's actually the director of basketball operations at um lsu the national champion lsu tigers so i want to bring her on and uh her name is shaida williams thank you so much for coming on good morning how are you i'm doing very well doing well thank you for coming on yeah thank you I appreciate Travis, it. this amazing absolutely well before we get started i would love for you to you know start us out in prayer is that okay that would be great awesome all right, here we are. Uh, gracious God, we come this morning. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we trust you. God, we thank you for your, your faithfulness. For morning by morning's new mercies we see, and great is your mercy toward us, and we're so grateful. Uh, again, God, for this opportunity that we may be your mouthpiece, that we may speak life and hope and, and trust and faith into the lives of those that are listening. Uh, thank we thank you for Travis and for his ministry and for what you have given him. And we just pray, God, that this uh, this time of interaction, this time of a prayer that your name would be lifted. Yes. God, we love you. We trust you. And I'm just so excited that ears haven't heard and eyes haven't seen. And we can't even imagine just the great things that you have in store for us. Yes. God, we love you. We trust you. And we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes. So walk me through, walk, walk me through your upbringing. How did you come to know Jesus and things of that sort? Yes. Well, I was um, born and raised in a... Um, Baptist home. Okay. My my uncle was my pastor. What? My mom and her sisters were in the choir, so we were kind of the the church goers. And okay, you know the great thing is is you know a lot of times you're in the church, but I you know I look back on it, I say, but was was the was the church in me? And did I realize then at a young age that I was the church? And as I've grown older, I've come to to recognize that. And the greatest thing, Travis, is my grandmother. I had a praying grandmother and a grandmother that continued to speak words of life and hope, and she prayed. and And that's just a word I think to so many parents and grandparents and and leaders is that the words that we speak and the prayers that we pray really do impact the lives of our children. Absolutely. So, what point in your life did you get to a point where you know it's all about a relationship with Christ, not just something that is you say? Right. I think around in in high school, you know, okay. just, just being in sports and realizing that. Um, you know, the accolades and the trophies and all that was great, but I knew that there was a greater call. And I always wanted to to be a people pleaser. So I always went to church and did the things that I thought was right. And then one day I was like, okay, it's nice to please people, but I want to please God. Absolutely. And the most important thing is having that relationship with him. Were you, how were you able to, especially with you, I think you played three sports in high school, right? Four, I actually. Four, yes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, played four so sports. Um, just growing up, loved running and jumping and doing all these things. So, you know, started out with volleyball and okay. then basketball and played softball. And actually, we didn't have a track team. So I, there was this coach and I was like, hey, would you be our track coach? And he said, yes. <laughs> so that's how the, you know, the fourth sport came along and wow. loved it all because they all brought something different. You know, basketball right. was my thing, but some of my friends played volleyball. So it was a chance for me to kind of hang out with them and realize it, it helped with the timing of my jump. Um, right. softball. I played little league growing up, so I kind of had a love for softball and got into that. And like I said, and in track, I'm like I'm always running, so why not compete and run? So, did you like basketball the most? I love basketball the most. Yes. Okay, I got you. So the reason why I asked you that is because how were you able to navigate the temptations and everything that came along with playing sports? Right. You get right. so many people that can praise you, right? Right. When things go well, but there's also people that can bring you down. With the criticism or the negativity. Right. So how were you able to navigate that in high school playing so many sports? The, I think with the balance, uh, my parents were, you know, hard workers and just always kept us focused. You know, there were times I could leave the game with 40 points and my mom was like, yeah, you you know, you could have done something a little different. So they kind of <laughs> kept me humble. Like, right. don't, don't get beside yourself. Um, I remember particularly one game we lost. And I, you know, had a pretty good game, but it was all, it's a team sport. So I want to win no matter right. what I'm doing. And I remember my mom called me and she wanted some popcorn. And I'm so upset about the game. I was like, you know, mom, not right now. She said, if you don't come up here and go get this popcorn, you know, so again, 
keeping me humble that I don't care that you just lost the game. I don't care if right. you're in your feelings. I'm still your mother. You're still going to be respectful. And That's there's right. some things that were taught at our home about being respectful and being committed and hard work. That's what it's all about. Yes. That's awesome. So obviously you had an opportunity to eventually play at Duke University. Walk me through that experience of the recruiting style and what that was all about for you. Well, I knew uh, once I was in eighth grade, I knew I wanted to go to college to play collegiate basketball. Okay. And I knew that because I had an older brother who played football at Grambling State University. Okay. And I remember one day, Coach Eddie Robinson, you know, we were like, we thought Eddie Robinson was the, the man. Coach. That's the man. Walked into our home. And so, you know, I have a twin sister and a younger brother. So the three of us are looking like Eddie Robinson is in our home to talk to our big brother. And I, we, we listened, we sat at the door and listened, and he was talking about scholarship. And, you know, you can come to Grambling and we can change your life with a great education. You can play the, the sport that you love with football. And I I remember hearing that at a young age. And I was like, I want a scholarship. So, I, you know, I talked to my older brother about what it was. And he's like, people will pay you for your mind. They'll pay you for your skills. And I, I, I held on to that and started playing some AAU basketball in the summer. You know, I remember getting my first letter from – you know, University of Tennessee, and then I started getting one from Baylor, and then Rice, and then these letters just started coming in the mail, and I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. What? Yes, and like I said, I have a twin sister. Okay. And she was the talker. Like, she was, she's a cheerleader, so we were total opposites. I was playing basketball and running outside and playing football, and she was doing cartwheels and all this stuff. <laughs> really opposite. So that's how people can tell the difference between well, you that's two. How right? they knew the I was like, oh, that's the athlete, and that's the cheerleader. <laughs> but she was uh, my biggest cheerleader. She always encouraged me and, and, and cheered for me. And, and my parents never made us, you know, dress alike or do right. the same things and pretend like we were the same person. They understood that we're two individuals and let us have our own desires, and dreams and identity. But she was my, you know, she was my cheerleader. So she pushed forth. And during the recruiting process, most coaches wanted to talk to her. Then talk to me because they're like, well, how'd your game go? And I just was like, oh, I did OK. Well, give the phone to Rashida and let her tell us how the game was and she'd give them a whole different, you know, <laughs> different perspective. I was just kind of like, Hey, we won. And that's all that matters. But oh, no. well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So how are we able to juggle like the responsibilities of like being a college athlete? Because the problem is, yes. and I think a lot of people today, a lot of athletes forget that they're a student athlete, right? Yes. Especially with everything that's going on with the NIL right? The, you know, and all these type of things that's coming at them. How do you, how were you able to juggle those responsibilities of being a student athlete? And I think what you're saying, student athlete, I always say, okay, student is first. And, mm -hmm. you know, obviously the game has changed for uh, for women's basketball. But in, in my day, my mom was like, you got to get your degree. Like that was right. the most important thing to me is, you know, I may get injured. Things may happen. You can't take what, take away what's in my mind. So let me learn and let me make sure that I'm doing what I need to do. So then I can take that degree and go out and, you know, impact the lives of others. So I was a math major. I always okay. loved numbers. So was a math major. I knew my mom taught school for 45 years. So I knew I wanted to go into the education realm of it and, and you know, possibly coach. I wasn't really thinking about coaching, but just wanted to give back my passion and love for, for teaching. And so I was able to balance it because again, I was it's brought up. Right. Yeah. You were going to get that education and use basketball as an a vehicle to get you a, a free education and, and take full advantage of it. And that's what it's all about. Because mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, and I hate the fact that, and it all depends on where you grow up. Right. It all depends on the background that you come in. And so I just feel like if they, people understood mm -hmm. the importance of education, education and you, and doing what exactly what you just said is using that sport as an avenue yes. to receive that degree. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that, that can happen for this, the athlete, because the thing is they think so much on the actual sport itself. That's right. And forget that it's only a short period of time. It's a short period of time. And, you know, and I had the opportunity to go to Duke university. So got a quality right. education. Absolutely. But I talk about this game of basketball and, you know, that Travis, there's so many games. I don't remember the score. I don't, you know, we play so many games that I don't, I remember the life lessons that basketball taught me. So Absolutely. also I'm going to use this vehicle so I can, grow up in life through this game and it is it has been unbelievable what basketball has taught me the the partnerships the relationships the relationships the the stick withness the accountability yeah. you know it's just so God, i can't even i can go on and on which is why i love 
I love talking about it. And I always felt, I was like, whatever you do, see God in it. And we see, you know, we see him in sports, how he has allowed us to, to meet people that look different than us and they mm -hmm. move different than us. And it taught me about understanding my role on the team. Mm -hmm. What's my role in, in the kingdom? You know, so just understanding yeah. role and purpose. And this game has taught me so much. And to be able to bridge and combine the two has been a, a wonderful thing. And that's the thing. God wants to be glorified in everything, everything that we do. In everything. Right? We work as hard as though we work for God, not that's people. Right. That's and right. so understanding academics is a part of it is super important. So while we do the recruiting process as, as far as like your, what was your top three schools that, that, that you just, that you were looking at? What made you decide? I'll, I'll, my top three. So if I had to go from the bottom, number three was Florida State. Mm-hmm. And one and two were very close between Duke and LSU. So I grew up in Louisiana. So staying here, you know, staying in, at LSU would have been kind of the easy decision. That I started coming to basketball camps. That's how I got involved in AAU basketball. But something about Duke just kind of, I was like, man, this would be so cool to, you know, to get away from Louisiana, get away from home. Now, at the time, Duke women's basketball was last in the ACC. So, you know, that was Christian Leitner and yeah. Um, Grant Hill. Hill, those guys were doing great things for the men's program, but the women's program was not heard of. You know, great academics, but just wasn't doing well. And they hired a new coach called Gail, and her name was Gail Gestenkors. And she convinced five of us. She said, come in and come be a part of something. Come build something. And and, and that drew me is you can go to the, to the sport teams that are winning, but go be a part of something new and help lay the foundation. So that excited me a lot. Was Pat some of that at, U at UT at the time? She was. Okay. Mm -hmm. And could it be easy for you to go there then, right? It could be UConn easy. And you, and once, once it got a little bit closer, you know, UT had kind of, you know, maybe you're not on my list, you know. So, I got you. Yeah, so you get, you get all those letters early, and then as the recruiting process goes on, people kind of start weeding you out, and you start weeding them out. So uh, Duke stayed on that list, and she kept writing and kept writing, and I was, uh, you know, excited about the opportunity. So walk me through the growth. Obviously, with you guys at the beginning, you said mm -hmm. you guys weren't as competitive. How was it from your freshman year to your senior year? Was there any growth at, at the Absolutely. time? Absolutely. My freshman year, we did not make – we didn't finish last, but we were at the bottom. But okay. we did not make the NCAA tournament. And we got our spring break, you know. So some of our teammates had been there for years, and they never made the tournament. So they were used to having spring break. Right. Well, we were like, okay, we don't want a spring break ever again. <laughs> Ever, ever, ever. So it's like, okay, right. we, we don't want it. So from that next year, we went to the tournament from my sophomore year to my senior year. And actually my senior year, we made it to the Elite Eight. So <sighs> won, the, yep, won the ACC, made it to the Elite Eight, and just amazing growth. Through so what was the difference? Just believing in the process, you know, believing in that process. Uh, sometimes we're like, this coach is crazy. But we <laughs> understood that she saw the potential and she pushed mm -hmm. us, pushed us, and we also learned that we needed to recruit. So we became the recruiters. And that might mean that I may bring in some players that are more talented and, you know, some all Americans and some others that may take some of my playing time. But if we want to win and if we want to build this program, Hey, bring in those players and we're going to recruit them and get them to be our teammates. So we learned how to, to build the program by not saying, Oh, let's keep them away so we can play more. Nope. Let's get some people in where every day in practice, we're competing against each other to become better. And in a way, that's being selfless, right? Yeah. And so, tell it. Walk us through that. Walk us the important. Uh, walk us through the importance of being selfless. Why is that so important? It, it's so important because I mean, you know, we live in this me, 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 I, I world, and and everything is is about me. And I, mm -hmm. I always would tell you know, share with people. I see you. I want to always see my teammates. I want to see their struggles. I want to see their hardships. And by seeing it it helped us become better teammates and less selfless. And I got, I had an injury. So I had a knee injury and had to sit out. And it was during that year more than anything that, okay, am I going to sit here and cry about it and, you know, go through my rehab and complain or can I find another role? And my coach was like, I need you to do scouting reports. I need you to be in the weight room, you know, cheering on your teammates. I need you on the, she let me sit at the front of the, of the bench. So instead of going to the end, and sit on the front and I need you to help coach him up and cheer him up. And that year changed my life. That I realized this really is bigger than basketball. This it really is. is an opportunity for ministry. Minister to the other players that were were injured. Like, okay, you're not, we're not gonna sit here and pout. Not gonna happen. 
we're going to thank God for this opportunity. And now how can we help our teammates see what's going on? And so I, I learned the game from being injured by sitting and watching. And that's a good point right there that you just made. Finding the good within the bad. Yes. Far too often we find ourselves in a situation where we walk in guilt. We find ourselves looking down upon ourselves. Right. Lord, why me? Instead of saying, Lord, why not me? Why not Right. Me? And, uh, you know, being able to change that mindset right. to a positive mindset is so important. And so he, the he, fact he, that you're able to do that is key. Absolutely. He said, you know, in all things, give thanks. And you don't really want to thank him for the injury, but thank you for this opportunity to grow and to learn. And, and Travis, I wouldn't be honest if I tell you that every day was easy. Oh, yeah. I the right attitude every time and that I didn't get off that path. That, that, that doesn't happen. But I had teammates and coaches that said, OK, the pity party is over. Let's get let's get back on it. Let's hey you you say you're a Christian. Let's walk this way. So I I had teammates that called me out that this if this is who you say you are, then walk in it. That's true because like all, so often okay you say yeah. you're a Christian. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm a, I'm gonna hold you accountable. Hold you accountable. And that's a good way. To, that's a good. Honestly, I wouldn't have it any other way. I love it. Why not? Right? Why not? So in your opinion, how has college basketball has changed in your playing days to now? Oh, it, it's changed so much. First of all. The exposure just for women's basketball, the, the TV coverage, the, you know, the radio coverage, the social media. You know, I, I tell my son, I have a 17 year old. I say, you know, when I was in college, like I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't. There was no Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. And, and Travis, in so many ways, I'm grateful <laughs> that it wasn't because it, 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 it did allow me to stay more focused just on my yeah. academics and basketball. I wasn't walking to class and texting. Mm -hmm. yeah, if, if I was going to call my mom and if I say I'm calling you at six, I had to call at six. It wasn't, hey, I'm sorry, I'm late. You know, some people, they may come to practice. Hey, I'm going to be a few minutes late. You showed up on time because there was no in-between time to communicate. I'm going to be late. You found right. a way to be on time. So I think what has changed so much are the electronic devices, are the NIL deals that now kids are I think it's a great thing to learn in the business side of it and how to negotiate, how to negotiate and what the real world is actually going to look like. Um, but I also feel like there are times that they're not present. They're not present on the court. They're not present in class because it's the constant buzzing on their hip, you know, with the, the mm -hmm. cell phones or, OK, what when I get out of practice, what's my next NIL deal? So there there's some some good and some bad that I think will come with that. Distractions, too. It can be a distraction yes. in so many ways. How were you able to navigate and help them to understand the importance of like, yo, chill out, be, you know, stay focused. How were you able to communicate that? So just communicating it in a way of, you know, helping them understand it. You're a student athlete. So how important academics are, how important uh, this game that you love. Like once you're on the court, let's stay locked in and let's stay focused there Absolutely. to do the things you've been called to. And now I'll, I'll make one correction in your in your intro. So for the, my first six years at LSU, I was the director of operations under okay. Mickey Fargus. Okay. And then when Coach Mulkey came in, you know, with change comes change with with staff. And so now I've moved to administration. So I'm okay. coordinator over all athletics administration. Awesome. But God saw fit that when Coach Mulkey came in, she was looking for a color radio analyst. And so some people said, hey, have you ever done radio? No. What's going on? Hey, would you mind? We got, we got a guy doing play by play. What about if you did the if you were the color analyst? You played the game, you know the game. And I just told God, you know, God, you're so gracious that you would allow me to talk about a game that I used to play and a game that I love and a game that has impacted my life. So wow. I moved from the women's basketball staff, but moved back in a different role. Wow. To be and a color then, analyst. And then that role opened up an opportunity. Hey, coach said on Sundays, we, we want to do devotion. Can you, you know, you want, you want to minister my kids one day? Now we have never had a conversation, but just want, just out of the blue. Absolutely. And after that Sunday, she's like, every Sunday you're with us. Can you please minister to my players? So it has been nobody but God. Nobody. And that's the thing. He you said, have not communicated it. That's crazy. That he said, if, if you, if you'll lift me up, I'll do the drawing. Mm -hmm. And he, and he has drawn just even this connection. Like I am, you don't know how excited I get. I don't take things for granted. Like Travis didn't have to call me, but <laughs> he's so gracious that, that God, you will allow little old me from little Brule, Louisiana to be able to speak 
words of life and hope, knowing that no glory for me, but that, you know, all glory is for him, that he would be glorified. I thank God for connections too, because I'm be honest. I think I'm thankful that you said yes. yes. Furthermore, I'm thankful that you reached that you were able to answer your email. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> it's amazing how God connects people, and it's for a reason. Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing about what you said that was big was when you allow the light of Christ to shine through you. Yes. Although yes. Coach Moki didn't speak to you right mm -hmm. prior to right. obviously now, p other people were able yes. to obviously communicate certain things to her, and it right, was about it was who you are as a person. It was such a beautiful process. You know, when she came on, she said, you know, I know you're going to move to administration, but for the first week or so, can you be around? Because now I've been with these some of these players for three and four years. I've been with them through COVID. So, hey, can you be around just to help us understand? We don't know them. We're, we're inheriting and adopting players, but they know you and they trust you. And so I saw God doing two things. First of all, I'm going to have you there to cover them and to protect them. But also, I'm going to allow them to see that you're not bitter. You're not angry. With change comes change. And can you still be the woman of God that you say that you are? Kind of knowing that they fired you, so to speak. Wow. But that they didn't, you know, didn't retain you. And I, I think through that time, that allowed the light to shine. Now, I'm never going to say it's my light, but that God's light shined through me that mm -hmm. I'm going to give you the, the honest truth about each player. Yep. I'm going to tell you their strengths and their weaknesses, and this is where I think we can help them and how to grow their game. But just as people, these are some things you need to know about. You know, we got a player who lost her father her second year. So that's that's a tender spot. So I need to help you know that so you know how to, you know, how to deal with her. So, Which actually leads me to my next point, because obviously during that time when you got hurt, yes. right? you were able to sit at the, closer to the front of the bench, that's right? right? Was that when the coaching experience, like bugs, like kind of sat in for you? It started setting in because I found myself talking, you know, being more of a communicator. A lot of times as athletes, we want to lead by, you know, by mm -hmm. action. I'm going to get out there and I'm just, instead of talking, well, now I can't get out there. So it helps you to, now to verbally communicate to your teammates. Right. Hey, coach did say you didn't, you didn't call that screen and you didn't. So, you know, helping to validate what I'm seeing and, and she's not, the coach is not always wrong and learning to take responsibility. And I think it's different when you hear it from a teammate. Mm -hmm. And that's when the bug set in, like I said, doing scouting reports and starting to watch more film and understand the the whys behind what we're doing. Really, and yeah, I was like, oh, I think I like this game. <laughs> I think I wouldn't mind. So, you know, start doing summer camps and finding younger kids coming in and learning to train them on ball handling and passing and shooting. So, yeah, once, once the bug set in, it was <laughs> it was in me. That's awesome. Now, did you you started out coaching at vars at the varsity level? Is that correct? Yes. So after I, well, I got a nice little journey. So after I graduated, I told my coach, I want to coach. And she's like, well, I don't have anything open right now at Duke. But she told me, she said, go to Chicago and go to Doug Bruno's basketball camp. Okay. She said, he's got a, he's got an assistant position open. She said, go, he's, go run camp and he will fall in love with you. So I ran and, you know, did camp and just did what I loved. And before I left, he's like, you want a job? I was like, yes, sir. So right out of college, I was an assistant coach at DePaul University for a wow. year. And Travis, that was one of the toughest years of my life, uh, just being away from home. You know, born and raised in Louisiana, so dealing with the snow, dealing with the bigness of the city. But also my, my first month, my grandfather passed away. Um, a couple Sorry, months no. later, my grandmother passed away. A month after that, an aunt that I was really close to passed away. So it was just a lot of death and being away. So it was hard. And I was like, I don't know if I can continue to do this. But through the process, he's like, I still need you to be who I called you to be. So I'm coaching. And because I was so young, Doug is like, I need you to dress up for every practice and play. So I was like, I just came off of a knee injury. When I tell you, I felt like I was the healthiest I'd ever been. So I'm actually practicing with the team. And I said, hey, where's our strength and conditioning coach? We don't have a strength and conditioning coach. Can I be the strength and conditioning coach? So there were certain players. I was like, hey, do you guys want to lift? Because I promise you, you'd feel better if you get in the weight room, if you get your body stronger, you can maintain, you know, some of the things that we're doing on the court by getting in the weight room. So Absolutely. I became the volunteer strength and conditioning coach and I had players that came in and they bought in. And it was just putting my, again, my passions. I fell in love with lifting when I got hurt and I understood the strength. So it just... It just all came together. And I said, did that for a year and then went back to the, the I went to high school and coached for a few years 
and got a call from Coach G, who was my coach at Duke, and said, "Hey, you want to come back?" And I'm like, "Absolutely." <laughs> and so I've been, in, you know, been in this thing for uh, for a while now. Wow. So walk me walk me through that journey. Like, what should aspiring coaches look for and expect going into this particular journey if they want to be a coach? Yes. Uh, first of all, it's like you said, connections. It really is so much about the the people you know. And so a lot of times I say it's it's sometimes who you know that will get you in the door. But now once you're in the door, it's who you are and what you do and, and how you carry yourself that will keep you in that position. And uh, I think it was just so important to meet Doug Bruno and to hear the things and to watch the different philosophies because I'd been at Duke for so long. Right. It was good for me, even if for that one year, to get under another system. And then once I left, hey, Sha, wherever you want to go, you got me as a reference because of – the impact that you made on, on our players. So wow. it's about connections. I tell a lot of, go work camps, go, go to where they are. Don't just send a, an email. Hey, can I work your camp? And then that way people can kind of watch you and, and see the things and how you operate and see if you really are knowledgeable about, about this game, but more importantly, how you treat the people that, you know, just somebody's child that may never be a college athlete, but how you treating that, that little kid. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you know, it's funny how you brought that up as far as the, how you treat another kid because it, communication is big and it's key, mm-hmm. right, especially when it comes to coaching. Like, how are you able to navigate and communicate with certain players? Because, obviously, they have different personalities. Right. So how are you able to navigate that? I think in, in meeting people where they are, you know, so many times I, I think it's important that you have a standard and you keep mm-hmm. that standard there, but – they're also in doing that. Okay, this is my standard, but I'm going to meet you where you are to, to bring you up to that. And seeing, you got to see people, you got to hear them. Yes. We got to pray for them. And then we have to do the work. I'm hungry. Yes. Okay, I'll pray for you. No, feed them. You know, so not just naturally, but also spiritually that when, when, when we see people in need, what are we willing to do Absolutely. to help them? But I got to see it and I got to hear what they're saying and hear what they're not saying. Yeah. And so I, I, I was just able to form relationships. And when I went back to Duke in the summer, I would run with the players. I was a younger coach, so I was like, why not get into their space? So yeah. I would get up in the morning and do conditioning with them. I would lift with them. I would just do what they do. So when I'm like, oh, yeah, we are hurting. But if I can keep pushing, let's go. Don't give up. So yep. it was kind of a little bit of motivation to, to keep going. So then guess what? When they were having problems at home or when there was a relationship issue or – I had one player that uh, her her brother passed away in a motorcycle accident and she just is banging on my door and just falls out and she cries. So I'm going to sit on the floor and I'm going to cry with you because I'm not going to say it's going to be all right. I'm not going to say, oh, you know, just deal with it. No, I'm going to I'm going to weep with you and hear your pain and feel your pain. And then we're, we're going to figure out how to how to call mom. And now we got to console her and be there for you. And that's what they want. Yeah, that's it. said basketball at that point. I can't talk about a game. I can't talk like none of that matters at that moment. But because of basketball, now we're here together, and now I'm going to use this opportunity and the relationship that we built to to pray with you and to love on you and to help Absolutely. you through this tough time. Can they trust you? Can they trust? Trust. Trust. When I tell you these young people today, they. They don't always say a lot. They are, their ears are always open. Yes. The first time you contradict what you said, they got it. Mm-hmm. And they're watching and they're listening and they're watching and they're listening. And we have to be consistent. We have to let them know that they can trust us. Yes. We have to show them that we trust them. Yes. And it's a it's a it's a two way street that we can't always make the demands, and then not follow through on our end. That's so true. And that's where the business side of things come in. Yes. Right. That's why they that's they're starting to be so business mm-hmm. savvy now. Yeah, because they're, they're of that. Just, can they trust you oh, at the end I, of the day? I trust you. I mean, now they have parents that are involved in negotiations. Yes. Some of them have agents, some of them, I mean, they are learning the business, but also the business of life. That you better find people in your corner that you can trust. That yeah, you're making all this NIL money, but when you leave. Do you know that money's in an account where it's growing or, you know, teaching them how to how to give something back? So true. So it's so important. Very much so. So walk walk me through mentorship. What is that? It's so important. And obviously, is there someone in your life that's made the biggest impact in your life? I've had, oh man, I've had so many 
beautiful mentors. Uh, mm-hmm. My first coach was my uncle. He was, I, I, I tried to play Little League. Well, I was the only girl on the Little League team. And so he was like, you know, hey, come play on my team. Because he would always see me playing with the boys. I'd play baseball, basketball, football, whatever they were doing. I wanted to play. And I played on his Little League team. And while all the boys sat kind of in the back of the pickup truck, mm-hmm. he always made me sit in the front with him. And we would ride and he would talk about, you know, I, I know you're a girl right now, you know, but I want you to go out there and challenge them. So he taught me to believe in myself and to work hard and to not settle. And, you know, even as I was looking to, to play basketball, it's OK that you're from a small town. It's OK that you're, a, you know, a little black girl. Believe in who you are. And so just his mentorship, but his love, he always you know, told me that he loved me. He's all, he always told me to work hard and, and just believe in me, but he was never easy on me. He yes. still expected me to, to do the, you know, do the grind, do the hard work. And he was a great man of God. So I saw how he treated his kids, how he treated his wife, how he was a principal. He was a coach. He was a te- He did so much. Wow. So he was just my mentor in how he, not just what he said, but how he lived his life. That's important. Yeah, That's it's important. So important. And it, it probably showed you what to look for in your spouse. Yes. Right. Well, it may, it makes such a difference. And then, you know, just going to college. My, well, I had a great high school coach. She was my softball coach and my basketball coach. So, you know, okay. we made a little, so she was very knowledgeable in softball and basketball. But I feel like I made her a better coach in basketball and she made me a better softball player because she was such a great. You know, so we were able right. to help in and teach each other and just in a lot of decisions on where to go to school. I consulted with her um, and still today she's one of my mentors and my my college coach, Coach G. We, not only did I play for for five years, but I coached with her at Duke. And then when she took the job at the University of Texas, I went to University of Texas with her. So we have been doing this basketball. So she went there after Duke? After Duke. Yep. So she was okay, at Duke for a while. So I played for Duke, left, went back, and we coached there for – I was there for about six years. And then tech, when, uh, when the Texas coach resigned, she decided to take the job at Texas, and we moved on with her there too. So I've had some great – some great, great experiences. That is awesome. So from an obstacle standpoint with you, obviously in life, we're going to go through obstacles. Mm-hmm. Right? So what would you say is the biggest obstacles that you faced and how did you, how were you able to overcome it? And I think is what I share with you already is the, you know, the, the, the injury. injury was a big one because, you know, when you're, when you're an athlete and you're always used to being able to go and run and cut and jump and just tell your body what to do. It's different when, okay, God, now I'm not in control. You know, we, Control the things you can, but those that you can't. Now, how do I how do I deal with it? So it was a, it was a big obstacle, but through our toughest storms is when when we grow the most. That's it. And so That's I grew it. so much, you know, during that. And because of that, other obstacles came. That okay, so I gotta learn how to deal with those. You know, the death of family members and the questioning of of who I am and God, what is my purpose? You know, all those questions came, but but through the struggles. I was able to gain strength from it. That's awesome. So, well, obviously, we I understand that fitness is a big part of your life. Yes. Right? Let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about it. So, how did your boot camp come about, and how did um, walk me through that experience for you? So, in July would be ten years that we've been okay. running uh, Coach Shots Boot Camp, and as I mentioned, I moved to Texas and was at the University of Texas. Went through some transition there, and because I would always work out with the injured players, or we just work out by myself, my head coach always was kind of watching. And so my last year at Texas, she said, hey, do you want to be the strength and conditioning coach? For I, I think you'd have a good impact on our, our young people and just get them to understand the importance of taking care of their bodies. So I, I thought it was so great. And there were some amazing strength coaches that had some experience that I was able to sit under and learn. But after our coach, she resigned from Texas, I decided I'm going to move back to Louisiana. My father was ill. So it was just like all, everything just kind of worked out that I think I need to be back here. Well, I mentioned a twin sister of mine that was a cheerleader. And well, she kind of wasn't working out very much. I guess she's like, hey, I need to, I need to train. I need, I don't want to be the, the unfit twin now that you're back in town. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, we'll see. So, you know, we do a few little things, go walking together. But when I got back to Brulee, little town in Louisiana, I started coaching in my high school and I decided I would start training the high school kids. Like, like we're gonna play basketball, we're gonna play volleyball, but we're also gonna train. We're gonna do some plyometrics. metrics. We're gonna do those things. While I was training them, three moms came in the gym with their daughters, and they just kind of sat on the side and they were like, "Hey, can we join?" And I was like, 
what do you mean? Like, can we do some of the stuff that you're doing with the players? I'm like, sure. I'm, I'm going to set y'all up a little station and do your thing. Well, Travis, they enjoyed it. They invited some of their friends. So I'm like, okay, I'm training <laughs> high school kids and I'm training moms. But they, wow. they kept coming. And some of them were friends with my sister. So they were bragging to her, oh, your sister's getting us in shape and doing these kind of things. Well, my sister didn't like it very much. So she called and she said, what about starting a boot camp? She said, there's some of us, most of these parents were teachers. So they were able to come in the summer. Right. She's like, I work every day and I can't come when you train. What about starting a boot camp? And I never thought about it. And I was like, we can try. And she's like, well, let's do it after the 4th of July that everybody get through. So she, you know, she's bossy too. So she's telling me what I'm going to do. My mom always said, she said, ooh, that's the bossy twin and you listen to her. But <laughs> that was her vision because she wanted to, you know, we talked about it. Right. And we started, put some flyers out. And the first day, 10 people showed up. And I was like, okay. So we, you know, we did a little weight lifting up and down the gym a little bit. And we did it on Monday, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. 10 show up one day. Next week, we had 20. The next week, we had 30. The next week, we had 40. By the time we were halfway, about six months in, I looked one day in the gym. And Travis, we had over 100 people men and women, boys and girls in this little small town that said, we see what you're doing and we want to be a part of it. Wow. And Congratulations to you. That's awesome. No, nobody but God. Yes. Nobody but him. And he, he showed me this when I was in Texas. He said, when you go home one day, I need you to talk to the people in Louisiana about fitness. Because every time I came home, we do everything around food. You know, it's graduation. We're doing ball crawfish. Wedding. Yes. We're, you know, like we eat, 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 but yes. also we got to move. Yes. And we have, we have to talk to them about changing some of those eating habits. We, everything doesn't have to have a bunch of salt. So I saw myself coming home one weekend because I, I never planned on moving back to Louisiana. So God said, go home and just and talk to the people about fitness. So I said, okay, God, I hear you. I'm going to go home one weekend. I'll announce that I'm coming in town and we'll do a little fitness thing. Never, uh, never knowing that I would actually move home. And this thing, I was standing on a box one day with 100 people in the gym. And I said, oh, my God. God, you told me this. And it never dawned on me until that moment, about six months in. This is the exact thing that you showed me. You didn't tell me how. You didn't tell me when. Because if he did, I probably wouldn't have moved back to Louisiana. He can't, he can't always tell us. He cannot. He can't. I will mess it up. And he can't tell us why. And he can't tell us why. So it wasn't because your father's ill. It wasn't because your coach resigned. He didn't tell me any of that. But. It all worked out. And we Do you have think that's it. why fitness is a big part of your life now because of what your, you know, what your family members went through? Um, I think that's why. But like I said, I, during during my injury, it just really, I saw how my, it was almost like going into the weight room was my yeah. therapy. Right. And I saw how I'm, my strength coach just kind of, hey, you can't get on the court, but you can get stronger. Right. Like he told me the things that you can do. And my coach is like, no, you can't play, but you can do a scouting report. So everybody, they didn't say, they never said you can't do this. It was always, you can do this. And this is how you can contribute. So because that fitness was my therapy, that's what boot camp has become. We, we call it peace, love, and fitness, where people can come in um, with whatever struggles they, they come in. And we're like, for this hour, this is your this is your time to take care of you and focus on you. And I had some moms telling me I can't come because I have little children. No, bring your children. I will, we'll, we'll get daycare. You don't even have to pay for daycare. Wow. We will find, so we, I had some younger kids on my basketball team. So this is their way to pay back. Why you're, why these parents come and work out, I need y'all to take care of the children. So now it's teaching them how to be selfless yes. and how to mentor other young people and how to love on kids. So yes. it, it, when I say ministry, that, that, that is what it has been. Wow. Are you able to, with your boot camp, are you able to teach um, like actual nutrition as well in yeah, addition to the working out? It's something that I don't totally focus on, but I do have, you know, kind of side clients where we talk about um, just balancing their portion control, being able to get, you know, I'll, I'll t go get blood work done. So certain things that I would definitely also recommend. Um, mm -hmm. I have a few ladies that are in my boot camp that are, that are nutritionists. So sometimes they will monitor them a little bit, but I tell them all the time, I said, we have a hand to mouth disease that there's no point in coming working out all the time and 
you're taking in more calories than yes. you're putting out. So just trying to make drinking lots of water. So, yes. you know, as we're working out, I'm constantly preaching, okay, we're doing this, but you must also make sure that you are eating and drinking and thinking the right things right. to take care of this temple. And that is so important. I, I really want you to really talk about this. Us as the body of Christ. Yes. Not all. Not all. But there's some of us yes. have issues when it comes to physical health. Yes. Right. Um, you know, for me growing up, my dad was a pastor, right? Yes. And after church, what's the what's most what is most people we do at church? Eat. We go eat. We got right? eat. We go yes. grab a bite to eat. Yes. And what, tell us the importance. Why is that so important to have a holistic living when it comes to health and fitness? Yes. I believe in health, wellness, but also yes. wholeness yes. and holiness. So we can put all of that. But we've been commissioned to go and I always yes. say, how can we go if we can't go? Literally can't go. Literally right. cannot go. And so we're not just called to the four walls of the church, but he said, go to the highways, and the byways. And so guess what? When I go. I want to be able to go because it might be I got to walk a mile to get there. Yes. But if I'm not taking care of myself, how can I go? And so we've been called not to always fill other people's cup, but to empty ours. But God, in order for me to empty my cup, I got to have the strength. I have to have the endurance. I have to have the, the stability and the balance. So we, we include all of that in boot camp. Well, you need all of that in order to be the hands and the feet of God. Absolutely. So Absolutely. we have, we have ministry, you know, so sometimes, I mean, we may, I may stop boot camp and say, okay, some, some of us, we're, we're not here mentally. So your health also is your mental health. It's also protecting your peace. It also means that maybe you shouldn't have come today because you need to rest. So I, I don't say just go, 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 go. Sometimes we got to know when, when to rest Amen. and to say no sometimes. And, and I'm preaching to myself right there because sometimes it's just a go, go, go where, we got to take care of self. Yes. And I, and I think it was John that wrote to his, you know, beloved, I pray that you would be in health. Prosper and be in good health. Yeah. And be in good, even as your soul prospers. So, mm. you know, so he may be in talking to someone that maybe had a disability or was dealing with some health issues, but your soul is prospering. But what about your health? I want mm. you to be healthy. And that is, I, I truly believe that, that God would want that for us. And one quote I love to say is, what we do is not just about adding years to your life because people, I want to work out, not just years to your life, but life to your years. Ooh. And so that's Explain why, that. Ooh. And, and what I'm saying is I think about my grandchildren, my great grandchildren all the time. And my child is only 17 with no children. But I'm thinking that far ahead, generations, generations and generations. So when they come here, I still want to be able to go outside and run with my grandkids. I still want to be able to lift them above my head. I tell them everything we do is functional. I, I want to prepare you to add that life to your years. I don't want to say I just lived to be 80, but for 20 years, I was immobile. I want to be able to not just have life, but to live. Wow. You speaking to me right now. You sure are. I, it, 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 it's, it's a passion of mine that wow. I want to see people not only just be healthy, but like I said, be whole, be whole in your mind. Yes. Be whole in your spirit. Be whole in the relationships that you're in. That's so true. That's so true. What would you say your why? What is your why? My why. Um, oh, I think my why is, is is love and passion. That. That I love. I said, man, God, I love your people. And and I love them because he loved me. Yes. And, there, and there are times that I say, God, I don't know why you love me because I, I mess up. I made mistakes. I say there are things I won't do and I do them anyway. And then I do it again and do it again. But yet you keep calling my name. Mm -hmm. you, keep, you keep saying, Shaida, I'm going to still use you. Wow. Shaida, I still love you. Shaida, I, you know, he doesn't need me, but he wants me. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. God doesn't, he doesn't need he does us. Not. I don't, I don't need, I, I, I can have the rocks cry out, but he wants us. He desires that we worship and that we, we praise him and magnify him. Mm -hmm. And because he feels that way about me, God, I feel that way about your people, people that are, uh, that are hurting, people that are angry, people that are mean, people that are struggling, everything that we go through as humans, he felt what we felt. So why can't we feel each other? 
and it's hard. It's hard loving people. But he didn't, that right. he didn't say, I need you to, you know, think about praying for your enemies. He said, pray for your enemies. That is something he commands us to do. So if I'm going to pray for my enemies and, and not just pray that, you know, God get them, but I'm praying that my enemies would come to know Christ. Yes. That they will accept him, that they will whatever hurt because hurt people hurt people. Absolutely. Whatever hurt that they're, they're dealing with. You know, God helped me to see that whatever pain people are in. I come to work every day and I'm looking for a coworker that might be having a tough day that I just can go in and just speak. You know, God loves you. And whether they respond or not, I want you to know that the God that, that we serve is bigger than your, your circumstances and your situation. Yes. So it's just finding that opportunity to, to love on God. So I think my, my why and my purpose is because he loves me, I have no choice but to, to share that love with others. Mm -mm -mm. What would you, what would you say is the advice for someone who feels lost, mm -hmm. who's addicted to something, who yeah. feel like they've lost hope? What would you say to those people? I, I would say to them that there is nothing too big. There's nothing too messy. There's nothing too far away that God is not. He's already present. Not even yes. get in your mess. He's in the mess with you. And, you know, so many times I think we look at the lives of others and said, oh, man, they went running to Jesus and they just are on fire. Some of us ran. And while we were running, we fell. Some <laughs> of us crawled to him. Yes. And some of us had to stay on our knees calling to him, saying, God, I need you. So what I'm saying, Travis, is all of our knees are scarred. Yes. Every last one, either from falling, from crawling or from calling. All of our knees are scarred because God, he said, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess mm. that Jesus is Lord. So why not now? Why not fulfill our purpose on earth? Because I'm a believer. We, we, there, there's some things that, you know, a lot of us are going to heaven. But until then, what is our impact and what is our influence and what is our position and power here on earth to help others know about, about serving this God that is so great and so amazing? Wow. You're right. Wow. You're going to get me tearing up. Come on now. Oh man, God is so good. I love so His grace good. and His mercy so sufficient. Yes. Wow. 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 How did you feel when you guys won the national? When your oh. women's basketball team won a national championship? Congratulations to you. Thank guys you. Too. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, again, in everything, it's like, man, God, look at you. Look, you show up. You, you don't show up. I had the opportunity on national championship Sunday to speak into the lives of our players that morning. And I share with them that 17 years ago, so April 2nd, I'll never forget this, April 2nd, 2023, mm -hmm. we win a national championship. April 2nd, 2006 is my son's birthday. So 17 years ago, wow. I had a baby boy. So I say, it would sure be nice if y'all win a national championship for Seth. You know, he would, that, what a birthday present. But I said, you know what, 17 years ago at Duke University, we were playing for a national championship. I couldn't go to Boston with Duke because I was having a baby. Right. Well, I didn't I didn't get to experience the final four with them. I didn't get to experience the national championship. But 17 years later, <laughs> now remember my, remember my choices of college was between LSU and Duke. You're right. 17 years later, God allows me to come home. He allows me to have on a headset and I'm calling a national championship game on my son's 17th birthday. And as we're calling, and Patrick has been, my, my, my co-host, he has been with LSU Women's Festival for 30 years. He's been to five Final Fours, never called a national championship game. So he is as excited as I am because he's like, what if we win? First of all, we never made this to the championship, but what if we win this? So we are, you know, we're talking about it and we're just excited. And obviously we win. So the last minute I set up my phone to record him. The tears rolling down his face because I have been a part of this for so long. And look, look, look what's happening. We are winning a national championship. Wow. And, and you guys did it. That's the fashion that you guys won too. I saw the game. It was an amazing game. You guys such, played well. Such a great, a great final four for women's yes. basketball. I think yes. what uh Caitlin Clark, what Angel Reese, what Flaugé Johnson, what those players, even the South Carolina team, you yes. know, unfortunately. It worked out. You know, we didn't want to play yeah. South Carolina championship. I'm going to say that. And I don't care if anybody else. Is. 
because of the, you know, we struggled with them in the regular season yeah. and because of the size, I would just had a way that they guarded them that worked for them. Coach Staley, he, she's a phenomenal coach. Phenomenal coach. And what she has done for the game. And, you know, growing up, I watched Don play at Virginia. I wa- you know, so I'm, look, I'm looking at someone that I looked up to now yeah. impacting the lives of other people going from a player to a coach. Um, but the fashion in which we won it. And I, I, at some point, I knew we would win a national championship. I didn't think it would be this year and that fast. Because it's Mo- Coach Mokey's second year, right? Second year. Wow. And so the, the theme of this year was piece it together. And, and what I saw, I said, piece, the first thing that came out was a puzzle. And you got all these pieces. You know, you got nine new players, some transferred in, some freshmen. And now yeah. how are we going to piece all of these young ladies together? How are we going to piece the staff together? How are we going to make that work? Right. And I truly believe that that game was won because everybody played the Jasmine Carson. What Jasmine Carson did in the first half, mm-hmm. Jasmine Carson is, it's not like all of a sudden she gets this superpower to shoot threes. That's who, That's why she was at LSU, because of that talent. Wow. But God saw fit that in a national championship game, wow. I am going to show the world who he is. Who he is. Not who Jasmine Carson is. I'm wow. going to show the world who I am through Jasmine Carson. Wow. You got three starters sitting on the bench. With foul trouble. In foul trouble. Here comes Jasmine Carson. Here comes last year Poa. Here comes Samaya Smith. Here come the backups to the to the wow. stars. But God said, let me show, let me show you. And I say, God, we see you. And wow. so we can walk away saying God did it without yeah. Oh, yeah. a doubt. Without and you know, not to mention, you know, the viewership, yes. right? You know, almost what 10 million? Almost 10 million. Yep. Wow. To have crazy. that many people that watching. That many people watching. And it was more viewership than the men's national championship. That's right. That's right. That's nothing but God. Nothing but, nothing God. but God. Nothing then, but God. Then y'all not done yet. Not done. Look at look at Haley Ben Live. Come on now. Not done. So that's amazing. Now with that comes, you know, we, we get Haley. More expectation. More expectation. So now, you know, you know, fans, they <laughs> Don't win a national championship. You, you're the, the same ones that were like right. Hosanna, Hosanna. <laughs> Could you know crucify him? So and and so you expect that because you now know yeah. the expectations. But our expectations and 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 what we're doing for God cannot change. Absolutely, we cannot get caught up in the the hurrahs and the do this and do that that we forget who has brought us this far and who's going to keep Absolutely. us here. And that's why it's so important to find your identity in Christ. Got to find it in him. Because in the good and the bad, he'll be able to keep you level in, in the good and the bad. And I said all the time, the biggest change has been the NIL. Yeah. But I said, you know what, God, I thank you that I have <laughs> the greatest NIL deal in the in the history of time. <laughs> that you made me in your image and in your likeness. And that I have you. And you know my name. Can I use that? Can I use that? You can use it. <laughs> we have the greatest NIL I deal as Christians. Wow. Then. Nike can give, then Adidas can give, then any company, because we're in his company. Wow! Wow! I can talk to you all day. Oh, this well, is crazy. I, I would say we're gonna have we're gonna have to chat a little bit. Off, yes. Off, off, yeah. Yes. Off yes. Yes. So this is a segment. Real quick, I don't want to take too much more mm-hmm. of your time. It's like it's something I like to call the change up segment, right? Okay. Just fun questions I like to ask. Number one, favorite sports team of all time. Favorite sports team, Los Angeles Lakers. Okay. Days of Magic and Kareem. Okay. I'm way, yeah. So. So Magic's your favorite player? Worthy, Cooper, but Magic, yeah, was my boy. Number 32. Okay. This okay. number I wore, too. <laughs> yep. That's cool. So you, so you saw Love and Basketball and all that, right? Oh, yeah. That's little little Monica, and yeah. So I am a, <laughs> I'm a basketball fan. That's awesome. So from a now, is that your, what, what about your favorite college team? Favorite college, college team? Um. Now, I, I'm still say Duke since that's my I got you. I'm a model, but LSU, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go to snack, go to snack. Oh boy, hot tamales, and I know really? it's not coming from a fitness person, but I have a sweet tooth, okay. so that's why I can. You know, sometimes we got to preach from our pain that, that that's yeah. going in the flesh to say, you know, His grace is sufficient. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Favorite movie. Oh, 
probably Passion of the Christ. And I'm not just saying that. That is the one that tugged on me and just, yeah. It was a great movie. Great. It really was. Mm-hmm. And what TV show? I don't watch a lot of TV. Um, I don't know, but I'm sure it'll be something comical. But, okay. Yeah. What about hobby? Favorite hobby? Favorite hobby? Obviously working out? Outside of working out um, would just be reading, spending quiet time. Like when I can get a little time, I don't ride in the car by radio on. Like I need it quiet just because life is so busy. Yes. We don't even know what it feels like to be in silence. You know, we think, what's wrong? Nothing's wrong. It's, it's okay for like to slow down sometimes. And talk about that really quick, the importance of finding that, being intentional about it's finding it's, that quiet time with the Lord. Yes, and we, we have to be so intentional about it, you know, whether that's getting up earlier or staying up later or going outside. I realized it more during the pandemic. Yes. And five o'clock, six o'clock every morning, it was the birds that woke me up. It wasn't an alarm clock. It was God that woke me up, but he allowed to me to hear the birds. Absolutely. To wake me up. And it was just like, if the birds have a song this early in the morning, if they're getting up and being intentional on, on worshiping you, God, you gave me a, a song that the birds can't sing. Yes. And it was dur- more than ever during that time. And so I would get up every morning and just walk, I have a little, just walk my neighborhood. You know, everybody's inside and we, you know, we're, I said, mm-mm. God, I got to I got to know you during, especially during this time in in what our country is going through. Yes, in a, a more perfect way. Amen. You're right. What are some lasting words that you may have for anybody who may be listening to the pod today? God loves you. I think we got to know that beyond yes. the shadow of a doubt. There's nothing that you've done. There's nothing that you will do. There's nothing that you said that's too big that He won't forgive you and won't love you. He'll love you through it. He'll love you to himself. And uh, so just encourage that uh, God's love is like no other. Amen. Um, he hadn't given us the spirit of fear, but power of love. And so I always say, when fear knocks, fear not. Because it's, mm-hmm. it, but, but the Bible tells us over, fear not, don't be afraid. So a lot of people have the, the, the fear of failure. The fear of not knowing who they are, the fear of the future. We we fear things that God said not to fear. Yeah. So just know who He He has called you to be, and find your purpose. Find that that intentional, purposeful, alone time to, to ask God what what is my purpose and what would you have me to do. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I really do Thank appreciate you. you coming. I really enjoyed it. This is a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey guys, listen. Anybody who's listened to this podcast and we're really blessed by the words, you know, that were spoken throughout. I want to let you know, hey, just like, you know, Shahidi was telling us the importance of Jesus loving you. No matter what you've experienced, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you have done, he loves you. And he wants to have a close, intimate relationship with you. And the most important thing and to start out with is to re- receive the Holy Spirit yes. and surrender your whole life to Christ. And so I want to give you that opportunity to surrender your life to Jesus yes. Christ today by making him the Lord of your life. Yes. By repeating after me, just say, Lord Jesus, repeat of, rep, repent of, I repent of my sins. Wash me white as snow. Yes. I surrender my life to you today. I want to be, I want you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I believe that you died on the cross and rose on the third day. I'm yours. I'm Lead yours. The, way the way and guide the way. In Jesus, name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you repeat that, if you repeat that prayer, you're saved. But I want to give you next steps, right? The importance of obviously we talked about relationships throughout this whole podcast. But the way to do that is through prayer. Prayer is simply communication between yourself and the and the Lord. He wants to have that communication with you. I like to make that comparison with obviously a spouse, two two people together. In order for two people to get to know one another, mm-hmm. you have to communicate. You have to get to know one another, right? You get to have to get to know what their likes and dislikes are, right? You got to get to know the background. The whole purpose is to simply get to know Jesus Christ, not only through prayer, but also in the word of God. Understand how Jesus lived his life. Yes. I like to tell people to get a study Bible. I think that's a good way for you to be able to learn deeper of what the Bible is all about. Not only that, if you're big into a mobile device, download a version, the version app. I think that's a really good app to take advantage of. 
for me, when I first got started with One Walk with the Lord, uh, devotionals was a big part of my life to start out. Um, and that's a great way for you to be able to learn different stories, right? And core and, and parallel different scriptures that goes along with that particular story. And so definitely take advantage of that. Baptism, I think that's super important, right? If Jesus was able to be baptized, why not us? The importance of baptism is so important. That's the outward symbolism of what Jesus Christ did for us when he died on the cross, right? Died on the cross for us. And we should be able to do the same. So when we get into the water, it reminds us of when he died on that cross. And when we get out, it reminds us of when he was resurrected yes. on the third day. And so I want to let you guys know the, those type of next steps is super important. Finding a great church. A lot of people today says, oh, yeah, we don't need a church to be able to have that relationship with the Lord. It's super important yes. to find a good church that's preaching the gospel, preaching the truth. Um, that's super important. In a, in a life where, you know, things are politically correct, you definitely want to find someone, find a pastor who is going to preach the gospel. And not only that is the reason to find a good church, but community. I think that's key. Find a good church where you can be able to find a great small group of like-minded believers who can be able to help you along the way in your journey. Because let's be, let's be honest, you're not alone. We all are going, all of us as the body of Christ is going through the same thing. And so it's super important to learn from others, right? To be able to find friendships, to be able to find people who can encourage you, find people to correct you, to be, find people who can hold you accountable. And so that's why it's super important to find a great small group as well. So, hey, guys, listen, I want you guys to take advantage of this podcast. Share it. Please share it, especially this particular episode. Um, it's Unscripted for Christ. You'll be able to find it on various different platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, various different platforms from there. Take advantage if you enjoy a big reader. Definitely take advantage of, of my sports devotional that I had released back in 2021. It's called Let's Go weekly devotions for godly competition in the game of life and that talks about real life sports incidents and teaches christian principles within that so you'll be able to pick it up on uh my website www.traviswilson.org amazon or even barnesandnoble.com so definitely take advantage of that and listen guys i want you to know how much jesus love you i love you we love you and uh just have a blessed week we out <laughs>